Bad Idea is the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, DV What. Thank you, Mr. DV What, who is also known as our friend, John Jones. Yes, the eternal John Jones. Tony has the bad idea for us this week, partly because I'm sick. Tony, what do you got? We're going to be talking about smell-o-vision. Mmm, smell-o-vision. That, that smell's never going to go bad, Tony. Yeah, have you ever, like, just really wanted to sniff a podcast before? No, but <laughs> now I'm wondering if that's just sort of a huge gap in my knowledge that I should have been trying to fill this whole time. No, but there, there are some uh, interesting products out there that have tried to do this for modern times. But we're talking about a much, much older version of smell vision Okay, well, what is smell vision Tony? I know what it is, but for the conceit of the show, I would like for you to tell me what exactly are we talking about. smell vision at its base, is a way to insert smells into movies. Not like the popcorn that's already in the theater. No, like I uh, say... And the dude who's sitting next to you hadn't showered in three days. No, this is this is a way to make it so that you're more immersed in the film itself by adding a certain scents that can clue you into things that are happening or to make an aroma of something that's on screen appear and just make it more more potent, I suppose. Okay. So, in the age of new 40s cinemas that will actually blow wind in your face, spray you with water, and send titillating vibrations through your seat, there's something that is severely lacking. With new cameras, we can see and identify the type of bacteria floating in each blackhead on Superman's nose. We can see his wonderful edited mustache, but we can't smell (laughs) the man. We can't tell if he's washed that suit for ages or if the yellow sun also makes his already overpowered self smell like cookie dough. Man, I know this is a bad idea, Tony, but what you just pitched to me, the idea that you could actually have the dissonance of seeing something look clean on screen, but smelling (laughs) that someone had not taken a shower in a while, actually sounds pretty compelling as an information and storytelling device. Yeah, just like, I imagine that some of the times that, say, Daredevil is, like, rushing into a court case after he's beat people up, it's like, I bet you a lot of times he didn't have time to go to the shower, he's probably in a really nice suit but he probably smells pretty ripe. Could be. But yes, this lack of olfactory sensation is so flow-breaking. Where are you, science? Why have you forsaken us? Well, it turns out cinema owners and scientists have tried this before. The idea of smell vision has surely been around since the times of early theater, but has been tried as early as 1906 in cinemas when perfumes would be manually wafted in. 1906? Really? That early? Yeah, some of the earliest ones were basically... You would put a rag soaked in rose oil in front of a fan during a no- news reel about the, s- the Rose Bowl or something along those lines. Very basic scents that are just piped into a theater. It's not near as precise as some of the things that we'll talk about here in a little bit, though. Okay. Other attempts were made, but perfumes would linger for days. When you're trying to set a certain scene, you really don't want the whole theater to stink for several weeks, especially if it was a mix of different scents for different parts of the movie. Walt Disney originally wanted to add some sort of smell of vision to his production of Fantasia in 1940, but decided against it due to the cost. You know, that's interesting. I just got done reading a book about the early years of Walt Disney. Uh, for those who are interested, it's called the... <clears throat> for those who are interested, it's called A Mouse Divided. And Walt Disney was not above spending a lot of money to get the effects that he wanted in his cartoon. So if he said it was prohibitively expensive, it was prohibitively expensive. Yeah, and we're going to get into some numbers about that here soon. It wasn't until 1939 that true smell-o-vision would be realized. Swiss inventor Hans Laub came up with a system that would play small pipes in every seat and have a central distribution system with cartridges that were controlled by a projectionist. <clears throat> so it would be like you have your cartridge projectionist pushes a button when a certain thing shows up on screen. It wafts you with, I, I don't know, probably flower scents based on what I know about this technology, Tony. Well, it was a lot of different scents. Sometimes it would be gunpowder if you're in the middle of like a Western gunfight, things of that nature. I, okay, I could see that. That would be a good one. Yeah. He debuted this invention at the World's Fair that year, but he was not able to find a studio that was interested. 
Michael Todd Jr. and his father were looking for ways to enhance the, their production of around the world in 80 days. So he took this invention and made it automated. The cartridges were on a belt timer, and at certain points, the cartridge would be pierced and a scent would be blown into individual air, air vents under each seat. At a cost between 15000 at the very low end and a million dollars for large theaters, which is about 121000 or $8 million in today's dollar, a theater could have this system for themselves. That's a lot of money to have a real nice production of Around the World in 80 Days, Tony. Yeah, like, I'm sure that the movie deserves some really good production values, but I don't know if very many theaters were wanting to pump a million dollars of 1939 money just to make it smell a little bit. I'm actually not sure that it was worth that. I don't think I've ever seen a production <laughs> of Around the World in 80 Days that was worth anything like I've that never kind seen of it. expenditure. If I'm entirely honest, I've never seen it. I've only heard of it. Okay. Wasn't that like a Jules Verne book or something? Yeah, the book is fine, I think. I, I read like the like Young Readers Abridged version back when I was 12, so <laughs> probably younger than that. The first it movie was... designed to employ this was The Scent of Mystery. The smell of vision would actually reveal certain details about the killer, and usually it would be the smell of tobacco smoke, so you would know that the person was in the room or nearby, and it would reveal certain aspects of the plot to the people watching. This is one of those instances where I feel like I could probably guess the problem with this specific implementation. What, that people would smell like cigarettes? Everybody smoked back then. It was good for your lungs. That, well, okay, so that wasn't where I was going to go. I was going to say, and I imagine you're going to get to this as a problem with the larger technology overall, is that once you've pumped the smell of cigarettes into the theater, it's not like it's just going to go away immediately when the next scene starts. <laughs> Very much so. It's just one of those things that lingers. I also wonder how many people would actually be nose blind to that scent with how much people smoked back then, or if you could just smoke in the theater anyway. There must have been smoking theaters. Knowing what I knew about know about the, like the 40s and the 50s, yeah. yeah it's like they were smoking airplanes into the 60s and possibly 70s. Or smoking sections I still, of airplanes. In my childhood, I remember being asked if I wanted the smoking or non-smoking section of a restaurant. Yeah. Thank goodness that's over. It's not like, oh, well, you've gone over to the other side of the room. You're not going to smell the cigarettes anymore. Yeah. Yes, you are. There's a lot of waitresses that have lived longer lives because that's changed. That actually reminds me of my grandpa. Like, one of the only times I've ever seen him visibly angry at somebody was uh, the waitress came up to our table while we were at this place, the Ever Open Cafe, and... He's like, this is the non-smoking section, and the waitress was smoking a cigarette while taking her order, and she said to him, yeah, the government's always trying to tell us what to do. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, because I know how your family is, that your grandpa wanted to smoke, and they were like, nah, we don't, we don't want you to, but like, that's, <laughs> that's horrifying, that it was the waitress just being like, yeah, the government's trying to take away my right <laughs> to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> We packed a little mini bad idea into this smell vision episode. Yeah. About cigarettes. Anyway, onward. Ads for the film The Scent of Mystery proclaimed, First they moved, 1895. Then they talked, 1927. Now they smell. <laughs> Some would say that there have always been films that stunk, but at least it could be literal now. That's such a... It... That seems like such a poor choice at this point in history. I don't know enough about how the language has evolved, but it seems like the kind of thing that even back then kids would be, like, snickering about. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes you want that because some people will talk about it, but I feel like it was less targeted for advertising back then. A few weeks prior to the release of smell vision a much more cost-effective system debuted, where a theater's air conditioning system would put large swaths of smell into the audience. While this system was less effective and customizable, it costs tens of thousands of dollars less. So we're in like a smell of vision arms race at this point? Yes, very briefly, there was the smell of vision arms race. Okay. <laughs> the next major motion picture to employ this, Behind the Great Wall, did, did so to much acclaim. When a character peeled an orange, the scent filled the theater. Some critics panned this as a gimmick, but many newspapers, such as the World Telegram Sun, exclaimed, You've got to breathe it to believe it. Scented movies are here to stay. They're not. Spoilers, guys. I I know the end of this one. Yeah, I will say that the scent of, like, citrus or orange would be a lot more pleasant than most of the things that I've read. Like, just a little waft of orange. The idea behind it was actually pretty cool. Charles Weiss, the inventor of this type of smell vision, said, 
I foresee the time when you'll get a suspense picture of the Hitchcock kind. You see an old blind woman in a dingy furnished room. We know she's going to be murdered as we sit there and we smell Jasmine, the killer scent. Thereafter, when we smell Jasmine, we'll know the murderer is lurking around somewhere. I mean, it's not a bad pitch. It, it really isn't. And like, as the inventor, you'd hope you'd have a good pitch. But what's the bad idea here? Inconsistent mechanical problems plagued the first few films. Where some parts of the theater would be blasted with fragrances, other parts would be barely touched. So if you're sitting directly under the vent, you get an entire theater's worth of lavender just shoved right in your face. And then people in the middle probably wouldn't get anything. This led to many people loudly trying to smell the movie in the dark, sucking through their nose loudly. <laughs> Along... <laughs> it's okay. Along with this, it's very difficult to clear some pungent scents from the room fast enough. Taking the citrus scent of the air could take most of a movie, and it would be combined with other of 72 possible scents that were made with this particular smell of vision. Now, this sounds like it was a particular problem of the air conditioning smell of vision variety. You did yeah. mention earlier that there was one of these systems that had a smell for every different seat, and I would assume that that at least wouldn't have the problem of getting the smell to everybody yeah whenever you had the the individual pipes going to every seat it was just a very small puff so it really didn't linger around that long it was it's the much better and the proper system to use it's just so expensive the autorama systems that cost far less still cost a bit too much you're still talking about tens of thousands of dollars in 1960s money for a system that really didn't add much or sell that many more tickets at this time, there were actually a lot of other gimmicks being used to draw people into the flagging movie audience. People were switching to TVs in their homes, and filmmakers were desperate for ideas on how to get people back into the seats. Here are just a few examples. Horror director William Castle tried the following. For his movie Macabre in 1958, attendees are guaranteed $1,000 in compensation if they literally die of fright during the screening. No one died. <laughs> also, it's hard to collect. Yes. House on Haunted Hill, 1959. A skeleton flies over the audience, mimicking the ending of the movie. Which, have you ever seen the 1959 version? I have, yes. It's so campy at the end. It's so, like, it looks so bad, that skeleton. It's just like, oh, it's a marionette. And then you t find out it actually is a marionette. It's bizarre. I read some accounts at the time that said that the gimmick, when it was done well, was actually one of the more effective gimmicks of the time. I could see it, like, especially if, if you're experiencing a horror movie and all of a sudden there's just, like, a skeleton whirling around you above. That right, could yeah. be interesting. I was more talking scary. about the movie itself. Right. I don't know how audiences were at the time. Obviously, to my modern eyes, as someone who has seen many more horror films and been frightened by much more effective scares... It's not that scary, but maybe at the time it was relatively frightening and this added a little extra punch. I could definitely see that. The next one he did was The Tingler in 1959, and audience members had their seats rigged with electric buzzers. <laughs> I which about this it, one too. If you look up The Tingler, it's actually a really nasty earwig-looking bug thing. And that uh. would be a pretty freaky if you're just really immersed in a scene and all of a sudden you're... Like, you start feeling this buzzing deep inside your seat. Was that what the movie was about? Was this bug that gets in your ear? I uh, It definitely was too big to fit in your ear. I was saying it looks like an earwig type thing. Oh. Okay. It's kind I, of that 50s monster movie thing where just everything's huge. Okay. Other filmmakers tried to do some of the following. 1974, Sense Surround, which added a massive low-range speakers to the movie theaters. It debuted with the film Earthquake. The vibrations caused by the bass sound effects attempted to recreate the feeling of being in an actual earthquake. The film was a success, but Sense Around was only used in four movie theaters. I gotta say, we're we're kind of still getting that today. If you think about, I've I've been in some movies where the music and the sounds were thumpy enough, and the speakers were loud enough, where I felt like my seat was shaking for a minute. Yeah, I've definitely been at theaters like that. There's a XD theater in town, and if you hit the right, like, middle seats, man, you are just getting vibrated by how much bass is going through that. 
I wasn't even in a special theater, but I think it was Overlord I went to see most recently, and there was just some explosions that they mixed with the right amount of bass that just kind of reverberated the whole room a little bit. That's pretty good sound design. Uh, in 1981, director John Waters released Polyester, a black comedy featuring a new sensory, a new sensory experience he calls Odorama, inspired by smell vision Moviegoers are given a scratch and sniff card that correspond with moments of the film. On the film's DVD commentary, released in 2004, Waters boasts that he actually got the audience to pay to smell feces. <laughs> Listen, everybody wants to smell poop with the, with one of these things. You that's like the the instant place your mind goes is like what if there was a poop? Would I smell a poop? <laughs> you know somebody in the theater probably like dry heaved from that though. Oh, could be. <laughs> the thing about that is that it didn't die with the odorama. The scratch and sniff movie card was brought back for Spy Kids 4D. <laughs> Which I'm sure you're gonna get to in your notes, but I, I actually didn't get Spy know. Kids 4D. Like I didn't, I I didn't have that in these particular notes. I had some other things that have come up though. Yeah, that's v- relatively recent that they were still handing out scratch and sniff cards for at a movie. Yeah, I I could definitely see that being the most cost effective option, and also it really wouldn't overpower every other part of the movie. Although I'm sure some kids smelled it before they actually got to those scenes and got spoilers. Oh, you know it. I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and they would just get in the theater, and while the previews are playing, would just be scratching away at the squares, like, sequentially, not even paying attention to what they were telling you to do. Just, wow, that one smells like poop, Dad. Well, that's a popsicle. It's like a poop popsicle. Yeah, just combine those scents. Meanwhile, I'm watching a trailer for Penguins of Madagascar. <laughs> I I actually have experienced a form of smell of vision in person. Nice. Disney would eventually go and do this for some of their things at the Disney Resort, uh, most specifically the Animal Kingdom. They had a thing called It's Tough to Be a Bug, which is an offshoot of It's a, uh, a Bug's Life. And it was interesting because you actually did get to smell like fresh cut grass and you got to smell a few different things that were uh, that were just pumped in. I didn't like it because they also had something that jabbed you in the spine whenever there was supposed to be, like, a bug walking behind you. You didn't like it because your spine is messed up, not because it scared you. Oh, I was, like, 12 at the time, so my spine was still okay. Oh, so it did scare you. It was more that it actually hurt. Like, I was leaning fully back, like, because I was in one of the front rows, so just, like, full pressure against it, and something just jabbed me badly. It was weird. Ow. (laughs) Well, it's tough to be a bug, Tony. Yes, definitely. What are you going to do? One of my favorite things that actually came of this research, though, was a 1965 April Fool's Day prank by the BBC. The network aired an interview with a man who invented a new technology called smell vision that allowed viewers at home to experience aromas produced in the television studio to demonstrate the man chopped some onions and brewed a pot of coffee. Viewers called in to confirm that they had smelled the aromas that were transmitted through their television sets. Man, that's just, like, confirmation of the fantastic suggestibility of the human mind. Like, I don't even get to hate on those people. I think if you have the right combination of sights and sounds and you tell people here, you can smell this, right? And they think they should be able to smell it. Their brain is just going to fill in the blank. Yeah. Especially for very familiar smells like coffee. Yeah. Or so, on, like onions. If they have like a close up of those onions as they were being cut and that sound of the chopping. And then if they put it in a pan and it's sizzling, like, I, I can almost make myself smell that right now, and I have a yeah. cold, <laughs> and it's not, you know, onions in my room. And that's also like a harmless, fun prank. Those are the best type that aren't going to hurt anybody, unless somebody thinks they're allergic to onions and has like a really weird allergic reaction. <laughs> that would be such a specific problem. Well, anyway, smell vision hasn't quite vanished yet. A new product called Cyrano is a programmable scent machine about the size of an Amazon Echo. Using an app tied to your phone, it can release many fine scents like a Glade plugin. And it's currently being programmed to work with short films to give a full scented experience. That reminds me of the thing that I thought as you were saying, you know, this whole, as you were telling us this whole bad idea was that 
this obviously has some problems working in an open area, right? Like in a theater or even in your living room, if there's a thing that's puffing out smells at a level where you can actually sense them, it's going to have the smells linger. It's going to have weird distribution problems. But with the advent of VR, there's part of me that wonders if this technology might be able to be implemented in something like a VR headset where it's just going to give a little puff right towards your nose to increase that level of immersion. And you don't have the problems that you would have had with having to fill a whole room. I imagine that there's some weird technical things you'd have to figure out, like would the person have to wear a backpack, like all sorts of things there, but it's not a bad idea. It's just It might be a bad idea, but it's it could be. It's a (laughs) maybe less bad idea than trying to fill a whole theater through your air conditioning system with the smell of jasmine or whatever it was that they were doing. Also, there's a lot of things in VR that I wouldn't want to smell. Like if you're playing like Senua's Sacrifice or something like that, it would be it would be pretty nasty. I was playing some uh, Resident Evil VR this past weekend, and I tell you, I don't know, I don't want to know what that house smelled like. Well, that's part of the torture, Tony. That's true. People put on VR headsets, especially for a scary games, so they can videotape themselves being absolutely horrified yeah. and poop in their pants. Yep, and that would definitely add to that experience because it's easier for me to re- like to be like, oh, this isn't real. But some of the people I was playing the game with like literally screeched and ripped the headset off. I would have been in that camp, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I do not deal well with scares. I'm very invested in horror movies and all that stuff. I, I cannot divorce myself from the reality of the, if it's well done, of the thing on TV. <laughs> that and- has nothing to do with smell vision though. It was just a side tangent. Yes, we had a few of those this episode. It's fine, because I'm sick, Tony, and we just got through Thanksgiving, and everything will be back to normal soon. Hopefully. We'll tell ourselves that until it is true. Yes, might be six months from now. Hopefully sooner. But the bad idea here is mostly that it's very, very technically hard and expensive to make Smell-O-Vision work. It's not the worst idea we've had. By a long shot. It's a cool technological thing that if you could actually get to work for a a decent price, might be fun and immersive for movies. But at at the moment, even the 4D cinematic experiences that are out there, it's just a little too difficult to get it to work properly. I saw that there are some new ones in LA that are doing this, where it it costs about 10 bucks extra per ticket, and whenever you're watching Fast and the Furious, you actually get like burnout tire smells and things of that nature. Vin Diesel Sweat, now exclusively at the Dolby Super Digital. (laughs) So it's something that they're still playing with, even though it's been 60, no, like 80 years since the first iteration of it. So it's interesting to see how it's still sticking around, but it is so expensive that I don't think it's ever going to be in the average theater and probably not in the home. The most fascinating thing to me about this whole thing was that you mentioned that in the 60s, theaters were starting to try to find a gimmick to stop people from staying at home and watching television. And it's like nothing has changed. (laughs) I don't know if they did find the gimmick and then people stopped going to theaters again, or if theaters are just over worried about Netflix and TV and all that stuff. But it seems like movies and theaters are still here and TV is still here. And they're both mostly okay. Sometimes. Yeah. Most of the time. They have made changes that I like, like bigger, comfier seats and all that. Keep fighting it out, Netflix and theaters. Yes. All right. Nobody ever wins. <laughs> I think that's going to do it for Bad Ideas this week. Thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed this, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash human echoes. We'd love to see some new supporters over there. We'd love to also hear your ideas, so send us an email at badideashow at gmail.com. Hit us up on the episode on YouTube, or hit us up on Twitter at human echoes. We'll see you next week. Take care, y'all. Bye, everybody.